wife of an activist arrested in Sudan is pleading for the government to release her husband. Sudanese-American Rodwan Dawood was detained by security agents a week ago in the capital Khartoum. His wife Nancy told Al Jazeera he was preparing to take part in a demonstration the next day. When Nancy Dawood says her husband is a peaceful activist, she's urging the U.S. to help free him. I do hope that they will put pressure on the Sudanese government to be uh, able to assist in his release. Um, definitely um, counting on them uh, with any leverage we have with the Sudanese government to make sure that that happens as quickly as possible, along with the release of all of the other political detainees. He's always been a, a peaceful protester. He is has been concerned for many years about the state of Sudan and he has been trying to bring change. Um, I think the voice of all the Sudanese are really crying for freedom, for peace and for justice. Um, no ruler should be in control for 30 years. So I'm really calling now for Omar al-Bashir to step down. Um, he's a dictator that has been uh, exploiting and oppressing the people for, for many years. An estimated 40,000 Rohingya Muslims have taken refuge in India. But India's nationalist Hindu government says Rohingya have no right to demand refugee status. Since December, India has deported at least 1,300 to Bangladesh. Natasha Ghanem has more from Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. For $112 a head, a smuggler in India promised a way out of the fear that had begun to suffocate Shamshida Begum and her family. Rohingyas are hated and abused in India. They were among 40,000 Rohingya refugees in India. Human rights groups say in recent years, the government's welcoming policy has shifted to a hostile one. In October, India deported seven Rohingya men back to Myanmar a country the UN is accused of committing genocide against this persecuted Muslim minority. Since December, the Refugee Relief and Repatriation Commission says India has deported at least 1,300 Rohingya refugees to Bangladesh. In the beginning, we weren't harassed, but at a later stage, we were constantly being monitored. So we got scared and thought they might send us back to Myanmar. Since we didn't want to go there, we decided to cross the border. Rohingya refugees describe a campaign of fear-mongering, harassment, and intimidation that's terrifying people enough to abandon their lives in India and sneak into Bangladesh. There has been a campaign against Rohingyas by these Hindu Hindutva groups to uh, create an impression that they are terrorists and therefore there have been attacks on these uh, uh, Rohingyas. India's ruling party says the Rohingyas have no right to demand refugee status, and India is not a signatory to the 1951 Refugee Convention. There is a security aspect also with regard to their linkages with dangerous terrorist groups that are inimical to India and fomented by or based out of Pakistan. And the last part is that end, uh, end of the day that these citizens are also leading to problems with the local community. It's been three months, and Begum and her family are adjusting to home inside this sprawling refugee camp. We suffered over there as well as here. We are facing many difficulties. Despite the hardships of refugee life, she and other recent arrivals from India say they're experiencing something new. <coughs> the comfort of being surrounded by other Rohingyas and a peace that comes with living in a Muslim country. Natasha Ghanem, Al Jazeera, Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. Yemen is facing a severe water crisis, with some estimates suggesting the capital, Sana'a, could run dry in less than 10 years. Over 19 million people, or more than half of Yemen's population, have no access to clean water. Dorsa Jabari has the story. These children in Yemen should be in school, but they are here instead getting water for their family. This is what they do every day. 11-year-old Moatez used to be in the fourth grade, but he was forced to drop out to do this. Water comes and goes in the morning hours, sometimes when I used to be in school. So now I come here to get water for my family instead of concentrating on my schooling. I want to continue my education. 
tired of this work. This water collection point is helping many families in the capital, Sana'a. But there is another problem here, the threat of cholera. And all these people here have been infected. Cholera is a waterborne disease that is transmitted through contaminated water and food. Symptoms include acute diarrhea and vomiting. If left untreated, death can occur within hours. The outbreak of cholera is attributed to contaminated water, unprotected walls. Outdoor food vendors are another factor. We advise people to use clean sanitized water. Clean water is hard to come by since the war began in 2015. The UN says two-thirds of the population does not have access to safe drinking water. We have been using water from a well for a long time, and we were doing fine. Then all of a sudden, I suffered severe diarrhea and vomiting. I was later told I had cholera because of dirty water. While this conflict goes on, international aid agencies are asking for more help as well as a long-term political solution for millions of struggling Yemenis. Dorsa Jabari, Al Jazeera. Taxi drivers are back on the streets of Madrid protesting against services like Uber. They say rival drivers from ride-hailing apps complete unfairly since they don't face the same regulations and costs. Protesters have blocked main roads in the capital and in Barcelona with their parked cars. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro has ordered a revision of diplomatic relations with the United States. That's in response to U.S. Vice President Mike Pence declaring support for anti-government demonstrators and opposition leaders. Charlotte Bellis has more. Energized, protesters in Caracas rally their movement, hoping to push their president from power. Out with the usurper. As unrest happened last year, our armed forces, the country's soldiers, many of them began to demonstrate their unhappiness. And today there are over 400 officers in jail who have been tortured simply for raising their voices against the regime that has broken the constitutional order. Venezuela's opposition has momentum. Over the weekend, 27 soldiers rebelled against the government. They were later detained by security forces. And on Monday, they moved through Caracas's streets with pots and pans, a statement that reverberated all the way to the White House. I'm Mike Pence, the Vice President of the United States. And on behalf of President Donald Trump and all the American people, let me express the unwavering support of the United States as you, the people of Venezuela, raise your voices in a call for freedom. Nicolas Maduro is a dictator with no legitimate claim to power. He's never won the presidency in a free and fair election. And he's maintained his grip of power by imprisoning anyone who dares to oppose him. While protesters and the opposition have a powerful and now vocal ally, Maduro countered with a TV address of his own. He warned vandals who attacked a cultural center named after Robert Serra, the late socialist politician. We are going to capture them all. They are all going to prison. Maximum penalty for the fascists. Hard hand, hand of steel. Maduro's vice president then took direct aim at the US. Because Mr. Pence doesn't have a job, now he wants to come and run Venezuela, handing out instructions on what should happen in Venezuela, openly calling for a coup d'etat in Venezuela. I will say it like the Venezuelan people would say it to you. Yankee, go home. On Wednesday, the rhetoric will be challenged on the streets. It's the anniversary of the fall of Venezuela's military government in 1958. The opposition marks it with nationwide marches, but they say this year it's Maduro who needs to go. Charlotte Ballas, Al Jazeera. Teachers in Los Angeles returned to work on Wednesday after walking off a job more than a week ago. More than 30,000 striking teachers reached a deal with the second largest school district in the U.S. on Tuesday. The agreement will see staff receive an immediate 6% pay rise and significant class size reductions. It was the first time LA teachers have taken strike action in 30 years. The US Senate will vote on Thursday on competing bills to end the month-long partial government shutdown. It's the longest in US history, with hundreds of thousands of federal workers going without a paycheck. The political deadlock began with the funding for President Trump's proposed border war with Mexico. Mike Hanna has more from Washington, D.C. 
Clerk will read a communication to the Senate. In this largely partisan battle, the faint flicker of a compromise, Senate leaders agreed to put two competing bills to the vote on Thursday. On Saturday, President Trump rolled out a bold, comprehensive offer. One drawn up by Republicans mirrors the suggestion made by President Trump this weekend. The plan includes $5.7 billion. Providing funding for the barrier, along with temporary protection for those in the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. Tell Congress that we are here to stay. And a three-year extension of temporary protected status. The proposal outlined by President Trump that we'll consider here in the Senate is the only proposal the only one currently before us that can be signed by the president and immediately reopen the government. But the proposal has been rejected by the Democratic Party leadership. The president and his team have tried to spin this proposal as a reasonable compromise with concessions to Democrats. That defies credulity. The second bill is similar to those passed by the Democrat-controlled House which provides short-term funding for the departments now shut down but excludes any provision for the wall. This would require the backing of at least 13 Republican senators to meet the 60-vote threshold. Neither bill is likely to pass the Senate, despite another plea by the leader of the House. Open up government. Open the government. Let's talk. Cannot have the president every time he has a, a, an objection to say, I'll shut down government until you come to my way of thinking. And as the shutdown drags on, a public plea by the FBI Agents Association. The FBI needs to be fully funded so that we can do our jobs, stop terrorist attacks, prevent criminal activity, arrest bad guys. That's what we do. We need to do that to keep this country safe. We want our pay. Paychecks are due at the end of the week, but yet again, all indications are that more than 800,000 government employees will once again not receive them. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, 